Well, uh, we should probably get started because I, I presume there's possibly at least one person on the live stream, uh, maybe even two, uh, and, and there's a couple people here in the room. So, uh, and the video's on and everything. I, 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 the, the camera's on me. I can wave wave to the people who are on the live stream. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I, I'll get started. I'm intending this to be a fairly casual conversation. Um, I was going to be co-presenting this uh, with uh, somebody who we've worked with quite a bit. Uh, uh, actually, let me take my mask off so I'm a little bit clearer when I talk. Um, uh, by the way, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm General Manager for Blockchain, Healthcare, and Identity with the Linux Foundation. Uh, for the past, last five years, I've been leading the Hyperledger Initiative, um, uh, which has really been centered in the enterprise blockchain space. And increasingly, uh, it's been central to a lot of the remake of the world through something called self-sovereign identity or user-centric identity, if you prefer a different term. Um, and we've been working quite a bit with lots of different companies on, on, on how this should work. And one of the companies that's really adopted this for quite a few different projects has been Accenture. So uh, when we proposed this uh, a couple months ago, uh, uh, right as vaccines were starting to be distributed, I think there was a hope that things would open up quite a bit and uh, 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 colleagues from around the world would be able to travel to the United States. So Christine is based in London. So that means she couldn't be here, but she did agree to pre-record um, some stretches of, of a presentation. Uh, and, and there's a short video as well uh, that we wanted to show in the middle of that. So that'll be about 20 minutes of the conversation. I have a couple of minutes of framing on either side of that. And then thought we'd just open up for conversation because this is a, a kind of a relatively new space for a lot of folks who've not been familiar. So we wanted to start with the basics of what self-sovereign identity is. Um, uh, and by looking at just kind of a uh, the, how it's a different model than say OAuth uh, or other kind of traditional login with GitHub kinds of models you might have seen, um, uh, and then Christine will talk a fair bit about the the business, social, and technical drivers for digital identity. Uh, I will talk about how it actually works, and then the role of Hyperledger, Aries, and Indy in making those happen. Uh, once again, I, uh, this has been my role uh, for a lot of the last five years, um, and Christine at Accenture leads their blockchain identity. And biometrics uh, division as a managing director. So she's been directly involved in a lot of this. Um, <clears throat> so I, this slide, I think, captures for all of uh, really kind of the essence of what's different about self-sovereign identity. Uh, at its core, it's about individuals who hold wallets, right? And in that wallet is uh, uh, are, are credentials that you possess that are signed by issuers on the left-hand side and then verified by parties on the right-hand side. Um, now these aren't just like opaque cookies and, and hashes. Don't think of this necessarily as like Kerberos tokens, although maybe some passing resemblance to that. It's a little bit like uh, PGP uh, or, or user certificates in a TLS infrastructure, but a lot of that stuff had never been uh, uh, really, really uh, adopted, standardized, promoted um, in quite the same way. Uh, we all kind of defaulted to you know real-time TLS connections to o OAuth servers and, and that sort of thing uh, to make this all work. Um, instead, Self-sovereign identity is really about you, your identity being defined not by what's true about you at LinkedIn or true about you at, at, on your Google account or whatever, but what's true about you as expressed by those certificates you hold in a digital wallet. And so and as an example, and one of the use cases we've been working with quite a bit, both Hyperledger as well as another organization I co-lead called uh, Linux Foundation Public Health, uh, and a whole lot of others who've been involved in this ecosystem, the Trust Over IP Foundation, something called the Good Health Pass Collaborative that we've put together. Um, we've been working in this domain of issuing proof of vaccination status documents that could be held by the issuer and presented in a privacy respecting way, um, not just to go to a concert in California, uh, but also, or, or, or Washington State or wherever I am, uh, but to also board a plane and travel to another country and attend a concert there, right? Your vaccination, you're vaccinated and that's good wherever you are. And that proof of vaccination should be able to carry with you. So. Um, um, really this, this triangle on the top half of this graphic only works because there's some relationship between the verifiers and issuers, right? You want to know that the issuer of these credentials isn't just, uh, I, I, you know, um, people like Drummond Reed, uh, who just walked in the door, um, I, I, you know, but are actually people who've perhaps uh, uh, issued your vaccination to you, right? Or a healthcare clinic uh, uh, who's responsible for those parties who've issued these things. Um, Drummond, this slide look familiar? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I think Drummond 
Drummond actually created this slide uh, as part of our work together on the Good Health Pass Collaborative. Um, uh, and, and so this is where the governance framework and the, governing, the governance authorities come together. And, and the role that they play is to provide that indirect connection, right? You don't want the verifiers having to call in real time to the issuers immediately on an everyday basis to be able to, uh, on, a, on a, you know, whenever a credential is presented, because then the issuer knows an awful lot about who the holders are, how they're using these credentials, where those holders went, and you have the problem we've been fighting for the last 20 years called cookies, and third-party cookies, and tracking, and all that kind of stuff. You've just reinvented it for a new protocol. So instead, um, this the, the the trust between verifiers and issuers largely comes down to uh, agreeing upon a common trust framework, and there's lots of ways that that can express itself. One of those is with blockchain technology. One of those is by having the public keys for the issuers held in a distributed ledger between all the parties, um, and having the verifiers able to query that no matter where that ledger sits, right? They probably have a full copy of the ledger. Note that they don't, you don't need to store the certificates in that ledger. Note that you don't need to know anything about any the individuals who are older. So this is not a system for storing private health data in a blockchain uh, or, or even who's ever been issued these or certainly not where they use them, but for being able to actually perform the same kind of function as the root key store in uh, your, your, your web browser, for example. You're probably all familiar with the fact that every web browser is distributed by default with a set of a couple of hundred certificate authorities, uh, and those certificate authorities are what allow the whole chain of trust to, to emerge so that a website can say, hey, I'm actually whitehouse.gov and and it's because you know um, the CA issued me a certificate um, in in the in, in in this space the digital identity space we're trying to move away from things that are so strictly hierarchical right we're trying to uh, allow for on a use case by use case basis such as in the issuance of proof of vaccination status those trust frameworks to emerge a little more organically between the issuers and verifiers uh, and so the governance framework is intended to be somewhat, somewhat use case specific somewhat set of stakeholders specific the set of stakeholders around global travel for example and the issuance of those health certificates uh, might be very different from the set of stakeholders around primary health data and, and, and continuity of care kinds of uh, situations. In fact, you probably want a very clear distinction between the certificates that express some fact in a, in a medical context, like I got a, a heart rate test, or I got a, a blood test of some sort, or I got a, uh, you know, something I might have to prove to an insurer to be able to get a, a good rate, and separate that from, I have the ability to board a plane to enter that country. And so that's been a big part of the focus of this group called the Good Health Pass Collaborative is how do we separate between the two. Um, and it really does come down to this question of um, who's the trust registry and how does the governance framework work. I wanted to set this as like the big picture context. Um, uh, as I mentioned, my co-presenter, um, Christine, could not be here. Rather than try to have her present remotely, we did pre-record a couple of videos. Um, uh, so why don't I turn the mic over to her at this point, let her start talking, and then I'll jump back in with a little bit more explanation and follow up at the end. Take it away, Christine. Hi, I'm Christine Leung. Thank you for um, having me here. I'm the global lead for um, Accenture's decentralized identity and biometrics uh, capabilities. And um, thank you for having me at the Open Source Summit and looking forward uh, um, to this discussion. Um, what I would like to uh, first start off with is what um, what is decentralized ID uh, and what does digital identity and um, self-sovereign identity actually mean? To me, um, I think digital identity is really about a way that we use our identity in a digital world, in a digital context, much like how we have a passport or driving license that we use um, to verify that we are who we say we are, just to demonstrate to another, from one organization that I got a piece of paper from to another organization that I'm really who I say I am. And the way that we think of digital identity, I like to think that this is a similar process, but all of it is done digitally, whether that's the, the credential itself, you know, the equivalent of a, a digital passport, digital driving license, my employment credentials, for example, um, to how I share this information. Say I got this information from uh, my employer to demonstrate uh, that I work for Accenture to then share it with, say, um, uh, an organization, my bank, that I'm trying to uh, apply for a mortgage. So that aspect is also done digitally. And really, if I think of what digital identity means, is 
that whole process of how do I use my identity, a trusted set of data issued by a trusted source, and how that is actually verified by the organization that need that information, and uh, how do they ensure that this is trusted, this is information is verifiable um, digitally, and that I am really who I say I am without seeing me physically or seeing the documentation physically, which is, if you think of it, most of this process has been around since the dark ages, uh, just to demonstrate who you say you are. And most of this is still very paper-based driven. So hopefully with um, the onset of self-sovereign identity and many other um, similar technology, we're able to ensure that um, we can use and leverage these technologies to make this process uh, fully digital In uh, as we go into an um, uh, increasingly digital way that we live our lives. Um, what it also means to me in terms of self-sovereign identity is that we are as individuals able to control our own data. We today uh, don't have much control over that. Um, we share our data, we don't know where that goes. Um, it's often shared with a lot of third parties and which one of us haven't experienced issues around user experience issues with a lot of cookies, a lot of um, information that we don't necessarily all read, but it's actually important in terms of how we share our data. So how can I take back control of that data and um, be selective about what data I choose, how I share it, to whom I share it with? Um, an example that I often use is that I have, um, I have a lifelong condition that I need medication for. And as I go into the pharmacy to pick up my repeat prescription, I have to provide a lot of data where I live, my conditions, so on and so forth. But if you think about it, all they need to do is to confirm, am I that person? Am I the, really the person who's uh, requesting for that um, uh, for that medication? The rest of the pharmacy behind me does not need to know where I live and what conditions I have. Uh, if nothing else, it gives me a lot of anxiety. And I think that aspects of what self-sovereign identity, the technology can really, really bring about um, a lot of potential because of the privacy preserving aspects of this, uh, the selective disclosure capabilities that um, SSI can bring, uh, the zero knowledge proof, the yes, no aspects of the cryptographic proof that can be used to just say, is this person really at this address? Can you calculate um, using the cryptographic proof to ensure that um, I, my address proof is the same? So those aspects of uh, going back to sort of user centricity, that how those capabilities within the set of tech, um, technology can help with making this more private, more user centric, and also enabling us if we want to share more data. For example, if I'm participating in a drug trial, um, I would like to share more information about myself, but at the moment it's very, very hard to do that. So how do I use that technology um, to enable that I share more data because I, it came from a trusted source. Um, I've been validated. The organizations that gave me the identity are on the trusted ecosystem. And that aspects of trust, whether it's the individual, the organizations that are in within the identity ecosystem that has been um, proven, and, um, and therefore how they can validate using um, uh, their public bits. And ensuring that organizations can share data through the individual and know that the source of the data is trusted, uh, has not been tampered with, and that um, the users have control over all of their data is, I think, critical. As we evolve in SSI, I also think that it is incredibly important in order to get adoption that um, there are other ways of uh, saying, uh, for example, identity fiduciaries, uh, custodians, um, the way we can potentially share data and have some blanket approval for certain um, uh, uh, verifiers and certain types of transactions to ensure that the user experience is good. I think half the battle with identity is really about adoption. And that um, as we as the sort of SSI market evolves, it's also really important from what we see in the market that it is not a binary con conversation, that it's not SSI or nothing. It is an, a, a, I often think of SSI as an evolution 
of what existing identity capabilities there are. You know, solutions that use PKI, uh, similar to how we uh, our passports work today, uh, solutions that work with uh, identity access management system. And the way that I think of the ecosystem is not about one size fits all. It's about all of those existing technology will need to work with SSI and vice versa. And I think that aspect of being a, not a binary or nothing mentality is incredibly important to get this amazing set of technologies out there um, so that it can be augment, it's going to augment the capabilities of existing IAM solution, existing PKI solutions to ensure that the aspects of sharing and using our identity data and the way to ensure that it can be trusted and verifiable. And I think the trust and the verifiability aspect is what you and the, um, the sort of selective disclosure, the privacy preserving aspects of this technology can really differentiate what came before and what will continue to exist. I think that aspects of working with existing technology stacks are really important and ensure that we don't um, we have the rest of the technology uh, community in terms of the, uh, the legacy technology that can uh, can support it and not about ripping and replacing to ensure that we are practical and can get this technology out there uh, for people to really benefit from. And of course, with it also comes a number of challenges. You know, we've seen um, we've seen that COVID has really accelerated the demand um, for a number of digital identity solutions, and SSI being uh, a, a huge um, potential candidate for this. We've seen the, uh, the great work that the Linux uh, um, COVID credentials group have been developing, the Good Health Pass Collaborative, which Accenture has heavily contributed to, also thinking through what this could mean. And I think it, now more so than ever before, with uh, the need for uh, digital identity credentials are really, really important as we are still unable to travel. Uh, uh, people can now work anywhere. I mean, I've been sort of stuck at home like everyone else. And it means that we are able to hire people from different places, but we need a way to prove that they are really who they say they are. And that to do this without seeing them face to face or using very weird, you know, sort of loading my passport up to the camera so that it could be captured, all sorts of um, not quite secure way of doing something. So how I think SSI can really help to solve some of this. But the critical thing will be helping to get adoption, getting people to use it. And that does mean overcoming some of the key challenges like governance. How do we set up networks that um, that are tr trusted by multiple parties? Getting the governance model um, sorted out so that uh, the business, the organizational level, see the benefit of the technology as much as our technologist can see the benefits of that technology. And of course, um, the, the aspects of uh, the importance of open source is really also to encourage adoption. And for this, we need more of the communities, more of the, uh, uh, um, the folks that are building the capability to participate in open source. Uh, we as Accenture, as we build our solutions around SSI, heavily uh, leverages all of the open source aspects of this technology because we strongly believe that in order to get the right set of adoption, it means that, that more people need to contribute to the open source code and to use um, the capabilities to improve and point it. Um, that's why we also uh, join Trust Over IP uh, amongst other organizations to help and drive some of this adoption. And we strongly believe this technology has a strong future, but it is up to all of us to um, contribute to the community as well as start working through to the um, organizational levels, the business levels to understand that the value of this technology is not just technology, but it really can truly transform the way we do things and the way we share our data and reduce all of the headache 
and uh, the repet repetition, the inefficiency, and of course the cost um, and the fraud around the kind um, the paper based processes that we have today around identity proofing and the use of our identity. You know, many of these examples uh, include you know one of our marquee projects, which is uh, the World Economic Forum's Known Traveler Digital Identity Program uh, that we work with with um, Government of Canada, Netherlands, KLM Air Canada, Toronto Air. Airport, Montreal Airport, and Schiphol, you know, piloting uh, one of the world's first cross-border um, decentralized identity uh, capability. And there are, of course, other uh, projects that Accenture has been working on. Um, and I think it's, KDTI demonstrates that this can be done. Um, governments can see value in that, um, think of the our travel continuum. Pri prior to COVID, we can have travel. We need to take out our travel documents, uh, our passport, and whatnot, about eight times in a journey. Now, uh, with COVID, we've sort of gone backwards. Now we need to take it out uh, uh, equally many times, but many more pieces of paper. And some of the automated, touchless part of our journey has been removed due to COVID. So, thinking of how can SSI really help? Uh, with um, making our future travel journeys more touchless, more seamless, safer, and um, not having to queue, ideally, um, is really uh, where this technology could really help. But in order for that reality to take place, we need organizations, businesses, governments to come together to understand how they can form ecosystem and collaborate, much like in order to prove how we can return to work, um, our credentials to uh, to get a job, uh, to do background checking. I'm a consultant, right? So I need to do background checkings frequently to in order to work at my clients. You know, how do I avoid having to fill in my the same forms of uh, where were you, where are you working? What is your role? Uh, what is your education? What is your identity details number? What if I can share this with a touch of a button using my phone to all of the clients that I work with that needs to do background check? Now, I've already been background checked. So you don't have to waste more money on checking. Do I have that degree certificate from 20 years ago, uh, which hasn't changed and will not change for another 20 years? How do I share that verifiable data in a trusted way so that my clients can uh, don't need to wait for me to get onboarded? Accenture also doesn't have to wait for me to um, get chargeable on a project and so on. I think for many of us who are contractors, consultants, it will make, you know, and people who move uh, uh, from jobs to jobs, like many of the developers who are contractors, this will make a huge amount of sense to show that you have those skills, you have been background checked, and that you can start your job right away. Uh, one of the things that um, um, uh, the health service in the UK have done pilots for is around sort of skills credentials to enable uh, the healthcare profession to move around a lot quicker uh, by showing that this is a set of trusted work credentials and that they don't need to wait uh, to be verified. And I think those are the kind of use cases that will really benefit um, organizations and that we as a community need to help drive. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to a demo video that we have around uh, COVID and uh, return to workplace and how we can use um, SSI in a practical manner to help people to gain, um, to get back to work easier, to get back into their workplace uh, safer, and how we can share these work credentials quicker so that uh, as we are all becoming digital nomads in our work life, hopefully that will uh, help a lot of folks to get um, to work from anywhere. So with that, uh, please show the video. Okay, uh, great. I'll pause just for a second here while I uh, get this going. And before I start, um, it is really hard sometimes to demo to, uh, especially a business level audience, like the value of decentralization, the value of privacy. Everything you see as like a wonderful thing you can do with SSI always can be done with a centralized approach. So try to read, the, look at this uh, kindly, if you will. Um, but I actually think, you know, when it comes to paperwork reduction, when it comes to making a lot of like, uh, unfortunately necessary processes smoother and easier, there's a lot of potential here. But um, with that as a caveat. The COVID-19 outbreak is unprecedented in our lifetimes, significantly impacting the global economy, rendering millions unemployed, but also proving that work can continue for many remotely. Businesses are realizing that their existing HR processes and the way we work 
will need to adapt and evolve to meet these new challenges. To boost the economy and get people back to work safely, businesses must explore solutions that support both a safe return to shared workplaces and a more dynamic job market. The success of a digital workforce solution depends on trust between individuals and employers. With our dynamic work credential solutions, employers can return their employees to shared workplaces safely, manage recruitment and onboarding processes remotely, and accelerate decision-making in a trusted and user-centric manner. In this demonstration, Jane, a certified accountant who recently lost a role at a travel agency, is looking for new opportunities. Jane finds a vacancy with an e-commerce firm, which she believes fits her qualifications and experience. The employer seeks to map applicant skills to their opportunities, vet candidates quickly, and ensure safe return to the physical workplace. This requires Jane to share her verified credentials remotely. On the smartphone screen, Jane securely logs into her dynamic work credentials app. She selects the credentials tab and can view the digital credentials she has received from various authorities. As part of the job application, Jane is required to share her education credentials, employment history, professional accountancy certificates, and her training credentials that she listed on her resume. This allows the employer to match her trusted skills to the job vacancy. Jane receives the job offer as a result of her experience matching the requirements. With the firm urgently needing to meet demand, and Jane having a family to take care of, both parties benefit from having Jane start a new employment as quickly as possible. Completing a pre-employment screening in near real time will allow Jane to get into employment immediately and will benefit the employer by minimising the risk of Jane getting frustrated and accepting other offers. With the Dynamic Work Credentials platform, Jane's new employer can request verified credentials for employment screening, followed by credentials for remote onboarding, without the need for Jane to leave her home. Here we can see Jane accepting the request from her new employer and agreeing to share the requested data, having established a secure private connection via generated QR code. In this case, she is sharing her passport, previous employment history, proof of address and background check result. A few days before Jane starts her job at a new office, her employer made a request for additional data to assess if she can safely attend her first day physically in the office. Jane can review the request and the information she's about to share before selecting to share data with a new employer. She shares her health status credential, which allows her employer to assess Jane's health and grant building access. Throughout the process, Jane remains in full control of her personal data, can selectively disclose her information, and can consent or choose to revoke access and request deletion of the data at any time. In this demonstration, a process that normally takes several weeks and many in-person interactions took a matter of minutes and avoided unnecessary physical interaction between Jane and representatives of her employer. With the Dynamic Work Credentials app, Individuals can share their personal information, professional skills and health credentials securely and privately, anytime, anywhere. This is crucial to building trust and confidence of individuals, businesses and governments and the first step towards reconnecting our society and getting people back to work safely. Hope you have enjoyed uh, that video of an uh, example that we built for a client and um, and find that to be uh, interesting. Um, with that, I also want to think of the future and uh, think of what it means for, are there any use cases beyond humans? Uh, one of my personal um, passion is around, you know, how can we apply the same set of uh, technology for other areas? And it's on things like um, animals, pet health, uh, animal health and uh, welfare. And I think in the future of SSI, um, I think it can be applied to beyond the human environment where we're looking at things like return to work, travel, so on. But for example, one of the patents I have is on um, pet health and how to apply SSI 
um, for pets and how do we, uh, and for livestock also. So thinking of uh, when we travel, uh, how can we take our pets along and putting in the identity of, um, of let's say, uh, a dog for when they need to cross borders, which is very common, um, especially in, in Europe. Uh, and how do we then replace all of the similar to a vaccine? You know, they currently have pet passport in, the, in Europe. How can we put the pet passport aspects of all of their vaccine credentials, whatnot, and the beauty is they have a chip. So you scan a chip and there's your app that the a pet parent has on their phone and be able to share that information securely so that you can clear customs a lot quicker. Similarly, I think a lot of that from a sustainability angle, uh, SSI can really also help. Think of the carbon footprint that, uh, and also, you know, sort of uh, how each car or each uh, plane can potentially produce uh, each factory. and applying SSI to things like cars, which there are several initiatives already, you know, we're working with the likes of Mobi to think of um, building standards for SSI for vehicles. And how do you then say, right, this vehicle has traveled this far, this is the um, emissions that it has uh, released, and how do we then uh, encourage car manufacturers, um, factories, planes, how can that all be applied to play a role in climate change and be able to say, right, I'm using this much, um, I'm producing th this much emissions, and therefore by uh, understanding my usage better, I can be more responsible in the same way that um, more accurate data can be um, tracked and produced if we assign SSI uh, to the particular um, uh, plane or the factories or so on, so that a more accurate reporting uh, associated with the entity uh, can be done through tracking of um, of uh, the identity of things, the identity of companies, as well as things like you know the climate change initiatives around you know cars and what the emissions mean. So you can have IoT devices in the car that tracks the emissions, uh, tie it back to the vehicle, tie it back to the person or the company, and so on, and be able to see and accurately report, and therefore hopefully help to change behavior in um, contributing to a positive climate change. So I think uh, as we move forward. Um, in the same way that we look at uh, how SSI can uh, support uh, changes in our identity proofing, I think the same thing can be done and uh, in the fight towards uh, um, uh, the role in climate change initiatives and hopefully um, be have a positive impact on many other aspects of life, whether it be identity of things, identity of companies, and so on. So thank you very much for having me. I'll be around for uh, the Q&A later, and thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Christine. Um, and we uh, couldn't quite get the the, the distributed Q and A to work. Um, I'm going to jump back in uh, uh, to, to involve her in the follow up conversation. Um, I, I, again, for those who had joined while we were showing the videos, um, I walked through a little bit of like the fundamental conceptual architecture, um, uh, which is really different about self sovereign identity. A lot of what Christine talked about in the video she showed was the uh, was the why, right? And again, it is really hard in a world where we're so focused on large cloud providers, centralized services, things like LinkedIn or Indeed or others kind of answering these things for all of us, to instead think about our technical architectures that are more based on data minimization, pushing things to the edge, uh, consent-oriented architectures, uh, and even a little bit of a better answer to this question, what does control over data mean, right? Obviously, if I share data with you, you and I have separate independent controls over it, but in a regulatory framework like GDPR, now there's some rules that, that, that can play into the system that actually do confer to me a little bit more control. But rather than talking about the big picture, I want to just parachute back down. This is uh, the Open Source Summit. This is, I, I, I want to just talk, talk about some of the building blocks that came together to put this together. The first one to understand, actually even before verifiable credentials, is something called the DID specifications, the DIDs, which uh, have been a part of the W3C, but there's been a lot of work done in other groups like the DIF, the Centralized Identity Foundation, um, and others to try to formalize and think of it as like the URL for an identity, which isn't one identity per person, but multiple, but 
many of them contextual and and that like and it's like the fundamental link, uh, the fundamental URL in the distributed digital identity ecosystem. Uh, the next thing that builds on top of that is this thing called verifiable credentials, uh, which have been a part of the W3C process for many years now. Drafts have been published through it, and it's on its way to a 1.0 formal standard through W3C. You know, some some uh, rocky winds uh, notwithstanding. Uh, and verifiable credentials are ba basically a, a way to say this did is attached to this st statement of some sort signed by this other party, right? It's a, a way to be able to say, and uh, Drummond, maybe there's a more concise way you can think of to describe it, but it's a way of saying, like, what's a diploma? A diploma is something that's bound to a person. It's a statement that you graduated from this school at this date and this degree, right? Uh, and uh, and it's signed by the school, right? And you know, fake diplomas are out there, whatever. And and but you should be able to look at a paper diploma and know that this is an encapsulation of those three different things. That's what verifiable credentials are, and they could be used for something as heavyweight as a diploma. They could be used to something as lightweight as your ability to board a plane, um, uh, your authorization to board a plane, right, in a given seat or something like that. But this is the atomic unit of, uh, of so much of what the rest of the self-sovereign ID world is built upon. The next layer, layers up, because there are a couple here, um, have really been put together by an organization that's part of the Linux Foundation called the Trust Over IP Foundation. How many of you have heard of Trust Over IP, been a part of it? Great. Um, Drummond, you, you should have raised your hand. <laughs> Maybe Daniela, too. Um, Drummond is one of the, the chief uh, movers and shakers in that community. And this is um, variously called the birthday cake, the stack, uh, et cetera. These are the four different layers involved in the trust over IP technology stack that are really how we get to from these primitives to use cases like being able to tie issuance of proofs of vaccination status to being able to board a plane. Um, Drummond would give a much better description of these different layers, and I'm trying to compress a bunch of things in into some time. There's actually a gorgeous white paper uh, written about a year ago, but under uh, 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 kind of being updated now, that talk about these different layers. And uh, if I can try to do it concisely, I'll, I'll give it a, a shot. The first layer is really what's the what's the uh, underlying utility network that connects uh, uh, the issuers and verifiers of these kinds of credentials. Um, and that can be anything from a public blockchain like Bitcoin uh, or Ethereum, uh, although there's reasons, strong reasons against using those, but a couple reasons for, to permission blockchain networks, to even a centralized database. This is not a, a blockchain specific system. Uh, but it turns out these utilities, you really want them de as decentralized as you can, as fanned out as you can, um, partly for privacy preservation, if nothing else. The next layer up is encapsulated in a protocol called DIDCOM, uh, which is really how do we get these agents and wallets uh, to be able to talk to each other so that when I have a wallet that holds my credentials and I'm showing up to enter a conference like the one here, then there's a, a verifier tool that wants to look at the QR code on that, wants to do a Bluetooth connection, however it wants to verify the integrity of what's been presented, that's the role that DIDCOM plays. And it can play it in a real world setting, it could play it in a virtual setting over, over, over the network. In fact, it's somewhat of a messaging protocol and it's peer to peer, it's point to point is the most interesting thing. So no one else outside of that connection needs to know that this conversation is taking place, right? An important thing from a data minimization point of view. Um, the next level up is around data exchange protocols. Uh, and I, I drum it again, I, I wanna get the con concise version of this right, but think of this as, you know, if you take a diploma, what is the format of the diploma? What are, what are the, you know, what's the schema for it, really? What are you trying to express in that? You know, one point of that might be the year that the person had finished their education course, right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> so, so these data exchange protocols uh, really govern kind of what are we talking about here? That's where we start to get more use case specific about how these might work. Um, and then at the top of these are, are really what's the governance network around, again, issuers of Back proofs of vaccination and verifiers, and that might be in a geographically local context or, or some other context. Each of these technical layers have married to them governance layers. And we all know that like governance has been a part of open standards and open source software for a long time. That's what the LF is kind of a governance as a service organization, right? Um, but there's others, IETF, uh, uh, ISO, IEEE, basically any standards body has played a role in governance around a set of, of technologies. Well. 
each of these uh, uh, technical layers also speak to a different kind of governance layer correlated to it that, that um, I, I, I really help make sure that, that, it, that these are fit for purpose. Um, the one thing I'll note is, you know, uh, the question of the wallet is really interesting. Will wallets go in the direction of being as general purpose as web browsers, where you maybe will have one wallet that holds all sorts of different verifiable credentials, from education to health to finance to all these things? Or will you have use case specific wallets? or even service specific um, is an open question right now. Um, almost as if at the beginning of the web we said, well, we have different web browsers for e-commerce than we will from browsing libraries or something like that. Um, so, so this is something that this second layer is kind of an unresolved question and someone I think we really need to dive in. What we do know is that the anti-pattern for that are things like clear or things like your Coinbase wallet or things that are extremely specific just to one issuer. Um, and I think that's what we all, it would be like having a web browser just for a single website and so that's that's what we all want to move on from um. I, I, this is my last technical slide, I, I, and it really tries to put verbs around some of these actors. Uh, uh, it really does say it's not just a triangle, it's a diamond between these four different parties, the holder of these credentials on top, the issuers, the verifiers, and then the trust registry that connects all of them together. Um, I, this is a whole lot of work has been done over the last year by uh, actually an amalgamation of many of the different organizations, um, Hyperledger, Linux Foundation Public Health, Trust Over IP, ID2020, which has long been in the uh, digital identity and human rights space uh, for a long time, working together under the aegis of a, of a common term called the Good Health Pass Collaborative to try to understand, can we apply this to uh, uh, proofs of vaccination status that allow us to be globally interoperable and yet at the same time privacy preserving uh, and, uh, and still meet all the different uh, differences and uh, in opinions out there about how <laughs> this kind of information should be managed from the European Union and a GDPR context to uh, I, I, to, to, to other countries who perhaps don't have the strong built-in privacy uh, uh, laws or even just not a culture necessarily of privacy. So um, at its root, data minimization, decentralization, con uh, uh, consent-driven architectures, these are all what has driven an architecture that might look a lot more complicated than login with GitHub, right? But lead us to, I think, uh, a more just kind of society, and that's where a lot of us have been working. Um, uh, I'll, I'll end with just a little bit of note about what we're doing in Hyperledger on this front, and then I'll pass it off to you. Hyper, uh, uh, pass it off to some conversation, perhaps. Um, Hyperledger, you might all might not know, uh, we are a community of a, a whole bunch of different projects uh, working together on uh, 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 basically all sorts of blockchain initiatives. It turned out that identity was one of the major use cases for this platform, partly because of some very thoughtful individuals who brought a series of projects in, Hyperledger Indy, which which is kind of a ledger platform, and then Hyperledger Ares, which is a, a, a project very much focused on the wallet side uh, of making these kinds of systems work. Um, and I, I, Ares is intended to be a library embeddable inside of other people's end user kinds of wallets and to do all the sophisticated verification, cryptography, things like Didcom and, and others, uh, and to be as actually portable across all those and make it easier for people to write both consumer wallets and institutional wallets, right? Uh, uh, businesses are going to be talking to each other about their own credentials. Um, and so uh, uh, this is, these are the roles that, that Indian areas have played. And they've gotten quite a few deployments out there. Um, uh, there's there's some, some rather big ones. There's one called Bonify, which is uh, used to be called Member Pass. This is a collaboration between a set of credit unions in the United States who've come up with a uh, self-sovereign ID approach for customers of those credit unions to use when they have accounts on multiple of those credit unions or somebody is moving from one to another because a credit union might be attached to a geography or to a job somebody has somewhere. They switch jobs or they switch careers. They bring some of their history with them. This allows them, in an in a, in a, in a individual first kind of way, to bring their financial histories with them, bring their credit scores, bring everything that matters, rather than routing this through Equifax, TransUnion, and what's the third one? It's the big three, I forget. Experian, thank you, um, uh, as a, as a uh, uh, really, really through um, um, the individual and their, their, their wallets to be able to share that uh, uh, with those that they care about. It's seven credit unions, 20,000 credentials issued so far, still very much in early stages, but um, this is, this is a, something that's gotten a lot of people really excited. This was built with Hyperledger Indy and with Ares. There's another big effort um, central to the German government uh, who have really jumped into this domain um, uh, called ID. 
Navy Union, which is a, 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 a partnership between 39 different partners building production level infrastructure for um, verification of identity data in finance, manufacturing, public sector, meaning government functions, and healthcare. Um, and there were been a couple of pretty major announcements of this recently. Uh, and in fact, it was explosively uh, uh, popular in, in a way that um, its timing with the election uh, made for some interesting uh, headlines in the last few weeks. But um, needless to say, this is something that a lot of our partners and a lot of our friends in Germany are really excited about seeing adopted more widely, including those at high levels of government. Um, bringing it back down to earth uh, in, in a very literal way, um, who's familiar with Kiva? Uh, a company that's been involved in the micro, kind of pioneered the microfinance domain. Kiva has been deploying a self-sovereign ID uh, uh, initiative for uh, the Sierra Leone government uh, that's intended to just kind of like MemberPass provide a user-centric credit history uh, uh, kind of system for a country that had no credit history, credit bureau uh, kind of infrastructure, uh, which meant that lending rates, because you couldn't tell whether somebody was a good risk, uh, tended to be 30% rather usurious uh, lending rates. Um, uh, and so Kiva stepped in, worked with the, the Sierra Leone government, with the UNDP and, and UNCDF on uh, let's, let's, which is the central, and, and the central banks in Sierra Leone, uh, to implement a, a system using both Hyperledger Fabric, which is more of a traditional enterprise blockchain platform, and Indian Aries uh, to uh, give end, end user individuals wallets that aren't just about holding um, some, you know, financial money, but uh, some financial uh, tokens but about uh, prove, being able to prove who they are when they want to open a bank account and the like. And so this is super exciting, and um, there are some really good friends of ours at Kiva. Uh, and um, there's not enough time here to tell you about other interesting stuff, but just north of us here, the government of British Columbia has been extremely ambitious in their deployment of this technology, not so much for citizens yet, although that's certainly on its way, and there's some positive word out of uh, uh, on Ontario about that from the, from the federal government there. Um, but uh, at the local level, they've been using this for self-sovereign ID for businesses, implementing something they call the org book is kind of a riff on Facebook, um, uh, but it's a way for business owners to hold permits and hold uh, uh, the different kinds of, when they engage with government, you know, there's a lot of paperwork involved that it means getting forms from one agency to another, different levels of government. Basically, this makes unifying government engagement by businesses pivot around the individual business rather than waiting for governments to integrate their back office systems with a common user ID, right, which is the usual pattern. So that's awesome. It's built on top of Sovereign, uh, which is a one of these layer one networks. Uh, and underneath that, the software is Hyperledger Indy. Um, not enough time, yeah, but maybe we can go into it in Q&A um, to, to talk about really this uh, other thing we're very excited about and put a lot of effort in uh, through Linux Foundation Public Health, which has been active for just over a year uh, in both uh, exposure notification, but, but now increasingly in this proof of vaccination status um, as a Part of that, we've been working with uh, healthcare authorities, um, both in the United States, in Europe, in South Korea, in Singapore, and others to um, talk about the standards for portability between these um, and bringing into that what we've built with a good health pass collaborative and a directive document that they published, which happy to share the link with you, into something called the Global COVID Certificate Network, which if all of our plans and ambitions work out ends up being one of the key ways that at border crossings between countries uh, we get from the California state or Washington state issued QR code, maybe some of you have, uh, or for, from wherever states you are, into something that, that becomes more privacy preserving than just a QR code because you have the cookie problem there, uh, uh, and then we're globally recognized. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there and probably uh, out of time to explain. Um, but I think we have two minutes for any q and A. I don't have the app open in front of me, so I'm not sure of anyone asking questions online, but I see a hand here in the room. Yes? So CCI, the COVID Credentials Initiative, which we brought into LFPH in December, had been operating since mid-March of 2020 on this domain. Here's how you'd use these technologies, right? Uh, and in fact, I uh, had started to see prototype deployments of this uh, uh, in a couple of different countries, uh, but it was really hard to get high-level organizations, uh, government organizations, to pay attention to this. Um, uh, they would vacillate between you know, folks in the federal government who'd say, this is not our problem, let's leave it to the states. The state's going, we don't want to touch this, leave it 
it to the airlines, right? Uh, or leave it to the, um, I, 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 you know, leave it to the private sector, they'll figure it out. Um, and then you hit a point, we hit a point in March of this year where the vaccines were getting distributed and people like, the vet pandemic's over, we don't need to worry about this stuff anymore. Um, and all the political pushback to the use of, you know, COVID passports, you know, as, a, a, as actually a fairly derogatory term because these things are much more privacy preserving than your average passport is. And then, and then people start, have started to realize in the last few months, oh no, we're going to be dealing with this for five or 10 years or longer. Um, and now, uh, in that window of time between March, uh, I'm sorry, between December of last year and uh, as of June, we published this thing called the Good Health Pass. Was it June or July? Um, the Good Health Pass. Uh, 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 August, right? Uh, it was it was finally finalized that we had to get IP kind of clearances, right? But the Trust Over IP Working Group on Good Health Pass finally issued the implementation. Uh, well, sorry, not the implementation guide. The what's the title of the document? Good Health Pass interoperability blueprint. Thank you. The interoperability blueprint and. Folks have been going off and implementing against that. Inside of LFPH, we have two projects, uh, one called Cardea, the other called uh, MedCreds, that are striving to be conformant implementations of that. It did drive, that whole process did cause a lot of the folks working in the space to realize that there were certain aspects of selective disclosure, for example, that weren't adequately addressed by the existing standards. The ability to say, I've got a valid you know, credential, I'm not gonna share my age with you, because you can see that I'm over the age of 21 or whatever, but I, I want you to know that at uh, I, I did receive a valid vaccine, vaccine, right? That selective disclosure wasn't really enabled when the signature was on the whole uh, uh, package, right? You know, we had to figure out ways to do signatures on each line, essentially. Anyways, long story short, there's still some hard technical work to do, but companies like Accenture and IBM, startups, uh, and, and most importantly, and this is what we've been working on, uh, uh, the right level organizations inside the European Union, we're trying to get this in, we're trying to hide somewhat below the, the fray of the political uh, uh, minefield, or the arrows and slings and arrows being shot around, um, but I, I, it's it's all being done in the open. So if you want to help, uh, uh, let us know, and and I'd be happy to tell you, uh, show you exactly where to get connected. Sure. Other questions? All right. Anything online? Woo. Right. Um, well, thank you all for joining. I'll call it a day.